Y cyfarfod yma yn cael ei recordio ar gyfer cofnodion ac y ddallau ei ddarlledu da, e, ar lein yn hwyrach ymlaen, os nad ydych chi'n hapus gydag hyn gadwch y cyfarfod nawr. So, diolch pawb am dod i'r cyfarfod yma am y sit, City Dechra Defnyddio Telescopes a Binoculars a bethau fel yna. Uh, enw fi ydy Dani a dwi i'n gweithio am Parc Cenedlaethol y Rhyri ac yr um, AUMBs, yr Aries of Outstanding Natural Beauty, fel swyddog awr dywyll. So dwi i'n gweithio dros yr adfel yn Gogledd Cymru i trio lleihau y llygredd gola a wneud lot o digwyddiadau fel hwn. Uh, so I'm going to hand over now to Roy, <coughs> who is our wonderful guest speaker. He uh, is one of the people who set up and oversees Battlestead's Observatory uh, in the North East, which I'm sure he'll tell you all about. So I'm really grateful that he can come and talk to us today because he is a proper expert. So Roy, would you like to take it away? Unmute, remember to do that. For some reason, my webcam is now <coughs> focused on me. I don't quite know why, but that's okay. I'm getting to the age now where a little bit of soft focus is handy. So that's <laughs> oh, just one last thing. If you do have any questions, I'll see if I'll question I or go bull. Um, and cross it, go on a question I and come right and it's just square in one a chat. I'm Ruan. Uh, Pretending dot after I'm said to share to actually go on a question I or a my cost to each show. Uh, or see, she just uh, gavel do a lot at a screen. Um, then I'll let you ask your question. Sorry, Roy, carry on. That's okay. Um, thank you very much for that lovely warm welcome and thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, so my name is Roy Alexander. Um, I am, oh goodness me, the founder of the Butterstead Observatory. I also run an astro um, social enterprise. We work in schools. I'm a trustee of an educational charity. Um, I've been a teacher, physics teacher for a long time. I've got a degree in planetary physics. Um, and I just love talking about stargazing and I'm just really grateful for this opportunity, Danny, because obviously our observatory has been closed now for a long, long time and I've not been able to do this for a while. Um, to do it from the comfort of my own home is great. I'd much rather do it from the observatory, but obviously we can't travel. So just thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I think the way that we decided we're going to do this, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about meteorites, actually, first of all, just for a couple of minutes, just to show you some of my space rocks. And then we'll get straight into talking about all this equipment we've got around me here after talking a little bit about um, about, about light pollution and night vision. Um, happy to answer questions. And Danny, I don't know whether you were going to get them fired straight at me by people or through you, but I'm happy to do either of those things. When I'm doing the show and tell with the telescopes and the binoculars, that's absolutely fine. Um, and also happy to do questions at the end as well. Okay. Um, so now this is the thing, I've got to get this PowerPoint thing started and then share my screen. So bear with me while I do that, please, everybody. Hopefully this will work. And right, that should be, you should now all see the um, PowerPoint. Thumbs up if you can see that, please. Yay, cool. So um, the third or fourth slide in this, when I talk about night vision and light pollution, has a couple of GIFs in it that have flashing images. So if anybody is sensitive to that, then do let us know um, in the chat, let Danny know. So um, talking a little bit about uh, Aha, about meteorites. Just very quickly, um, there are lots of different types and they tend to all come from large asteroids or, or uh, bodies in space like the Mars and, and the Moon. Um, but mostly they come from asteroids. And asteroids have a big metallic core normally and a bit of a mantle around the outside. So if you're ever lucky enough to find or pick up or buy a big iron meteorite like this one, um, that was once the broiling hot molten heart of a, of a, of a small asteroid or a, or a dwarf planet. Um, and they're pretty cool. So happy to do a bit more of a show and tell us on these at the end as well, if need be. Um, if you ever come across a nice rocky asteroid, um, it's an asteroid, meteorite, then they come from the uh, 
outer layer, the molten outer layer of the asteroid. This one's quite unique, actually. It's quite interesting because in addition to being quite stony, it's got little bits of iron in it. So what you can do is you can get magnets and stick the magnets to the little bits of iron. So that's pretty cool, having like a magnetic rock. Um, and also you might see there, there's this blackened outer layer, and that's the fusion crust that melted when it came hurtling through the atmosphere at maybe 40, 50,000 miles per hour. Now what also happens with uh, these meteorites is you can get meteorites that are a combination of, of the iron and the rock because um, some meteorites come from that boundary layer between the core and the mantle. And in that scenario, you end up with something like this. So this has been sliced, it's very thin because these are very rare and quite valuable. So people like me can only really ever afford to buy tiny little thin slices, but you can see it's got some of the iron from the core of the asteroid and then some of the rocky bits in between. And some of those rocky bits have actually crystallized out as well, which is, I think, really cool. They've turned into these olivine crystals. And if you shine a light on them or through them, they light up. If you were born in August, that's uh, your birthstone, Peridot, Peridot. <clears throat> so anyway, there you go. Two quick five minutes on, on meteorites. Uh, I forgot, actually, this is, that's my moon rock. So when you look at the moon and you see dark patches on the moon and light patches, what you're seeing is the rock that you see pretty much here. Um, the dark patches are the seas of the moon and the light patches tend to be the highlands. So that's a chunk of the moon found in North Africa a few years ago. So happy to answer questions on those kinds of things at the end. Um, and it's one of those things when you get into astronomy and telescopes, you end up talking to people who um, sell and collect meteorites. So you often end up kind of owning and buying space rocks as well. But stargazing, what are we going to do uh, in order to get out and go stargazing? Well, the first thing is you need really good night vision. Um, basically, your eyes work differently in the daytime um, as compared to the night. And that's all down to some biology, some cells in your eyes, uh, which I'm not going to get into. So don't worry about that. I'm going to focus more on the telescopes. But the key thing that you need to do to understand to how to get the best out of stargazing is to appreciate. Now, if you look at this graph here, that, that, that line coming down in that swoop, that's how good your night vision is. And the lower that line goes, the better your night vision. So you can see if you look along the bottom axis there, the numbers that go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you get a really big improvement in your night vision in the first five to 10 minutes. But at that 10 minutes point, that's when um, your eyes really come into their own um, at night. So if you want to do some proper stargazing, I mean, minus seven degrees outside, wrap up warm, definitely, um, and wait at least 10 minutes in, in darkness. Uh, luckily for, for most of us, if we do that from our own homes, we can stay in the warm, turn our lights off inside and uh, let your eyes adjust to the dark and stay warm and then go outside maybe between 10 and 15 minutes or 20 minutes after you do that. Um, watch out though, once you are out there and stargazing, um, let's say you've given it 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, oops, I've just gone too far. Once you've given it 15 or 20 minutes, you don't want your um, your night vision to go, uh, to be what we call photo bleached. Bright light destroys your night vision. Um, the reason I'm showing you this really complicated diagram here is just largely to tell you something about what we call averted viewing. So it's in green down there. Um, basically, and you might have noticed this, particularly in the winter, when you're up outside looking at something like Orion, sometimes that you can see just out of the corner of your eye, this fuzzy patch of stars just to the right of Orion. And that's called the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. And what you might notice sometimes, and if you haven't done that, then maybe give it a go tonight or tomorrow. Look directly at these this, this cluster of stars, the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades. And as you look directly at them, you'll see a few stars, but as you look slightly away, as you avert your eyes, they'll seem to get brighter out of the corner of your eye. And that's because all of these cells in your eyes that are really good for nighttime vision, they look like rods. You can see a picture of one there. They're distributed kind of around the, um, the outside of the periphery of your, the inside of your eye. So to really get the best out of stargazing, 
um, in re especially in really dark skies, when you look at something fuzzy like a galaxy or a nebula or a cluster, don't look directly at it. Use what we call averted viewing. Look slightly away, and then the light from that cluster will go into your eyes, and it will hit all the rod cells around the side of your peripheral vision. It's a really interesting thing to, to, to try. Um, and you might have done it inadvertently yourselves at some point in the past. Um, as far as night light and uh, night visions are concerned, we use red lights. Um, red light doesn't destroy your night vision. Um, and if you want to have really, really good night vision, you definitely have to eat your carrots. The chemicals in your eye that activate your night vision are based on a chemical found in carrots. That's true. That's not a myth. Um, things to look out for. Um, there we go. This is the flashing kind of light thing. If your phone goes off, if there are street lights and you just catch a view of one, if a car comes around the corner, or if, like in my old house when I used to go stargazing in my back garden, if someone went into the bathroom in the night and turned that bathroom light on, that was it. Your night vision's gone instantly in something like 200 femtoseconds, whatever a femtosecond is. And then it get, takes again 10, 15, or 20 minutes to come back. So do watch out for that, okay? Happy to answer questions on the night vision stuff at the end. So um, I'm gonna talk about telescopes a bit. Um, I'm gonna talk about binoculars first and then telescopes. And it's during this section that I'm really happy for you to fire questions at me via Danny or whomever through the chat. Is that okay with you, Danny? Thumbs up if it is. If it's not, we'll do it at the end because you're the other boss. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you after this, after I show you the equipment, I'm going to show you um, a little snippet of a guide of some things you can try and look for yourself out in the night sky, either using your naked eyes, binoculars or telescopes. And the guide to help you with that is on our website. Um, and that's the link there if you want to just have a quick snippet or take a look at that. And again, I can copy that into the chat later. Excuse me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to talk about binoculars to start with. Stop share. Oh, I think that's worked. Great. So um, you'll see behind me, I've got a pair of binoculars on a tripod. I've also got a pair of binoculars here um, and I've got a really small pair of very funny looking binoculars here. So I've got a few different pairs. I've actually also got some kids binoculars that are really good. You can buy them for about 10 pounds from Amazon. And they're really good for really small kids. I've got, a, how old is she now, my daughter? Five-year-old and she loves them. Um, but the thing about binoculars is they can be really expensive. They can, but you can get great results with um, binoculars that you can buy from Lidl or Aldi for just 15 or 20 pounds. The key thing to understand about them is the numbers. I'm just trying to see where the numbers are on this, these ones. Because the numbers are meaningful. Just bear with me a second. Right. There we go. So I don't know if you can see, can you read there are numbers on the back of those binoculars? What would be great is if um, someone can nod or smile or thumbs up, anybody. Yay, I can see a nod there. From, now you don't look like your name is really Naomi. I can see the young lad sitting there in his kitchen. You don't look like you're called Naomi Hughes really, but thank you Naomi for nodding. So there's numbers here and what do they mean? Well, you've got 11 on this one times 20, is it? 70, 11 times 70. That's what you get when you try to read backwards. 11 times is how much these binoculars will magnify what you're looking at. And the second number, the 70, that's how wide this lens is at the front. So they are 70 millimeters across. These ones here are smaller. They're 50 millimeters across. And these ones here are smaller again, they're 40 millimeters across. And I'm hoping that you can see how they all get bigger um, in a row, like nice, isn't it? Well, the bigger your lens, or on a telescope, the bigger the gap at the front of your telescope, the more light energy you collect from your sky and the better your view. You're more likely to see colour. When you look at things like clusters or the moon, you see a lot more detail. So generally speaking, people will say when you're buying binoculars or you're buying a telescope, buy the biggest pair you can or buy the biggest telescope you can. 
with telescopes, that's a really good rule. With binoculars, especially if you're a beginner and you haven't got a tripod to study them on, that's not the best advice in the world, actually. The best advice is to start with a medium pair like this. And these are 10 times magnification and 50 millimeters across there. 10 times 50 or 10 by 50. And you can hold these really steadily because as you can imagine, if you're looking at something in the sky and you're wobbling because they're heavy, then what you're looking at is going to wobble and you don't want that. We tend to recommend that you don't want to go any higher than 12 times magnification if you're going to handhold your binoculars. OK, um, we have loads of 10 by 50 and 12 by 70 binoculars at the observatory. Uh, and to be fair, the best ones that we've had that have lasted five, five, five years. I have got a degree in physics. I can do maths. That's five. Um, cost about £50. They're made by a company called Helios, and I'm happy to give you recommendations on those at the end. We've got three or four pairs of those at the observatory that have lasted years and years and years. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to get good value for money. Okay, so um, like I said, at this point in this part of the conversation, I'm more than happy to field questions from you. I can see a couple in the chat. Is there anything uh not just yet i think you can also click on your the raise your hand thing um but i am more than happy to be interrupted and i've got tons of time so unless there's any questions i'll dive in and look at telescopes so um where's my little telescope i've just put that down i don't know where i've put it so many things now I'm going to show you the first ever telescope I was given in my life. I was nine years old and for my birthday, my granddad gave me this. Look at that. Now, I actually thought that was awesome. I thought that's a proper pirate telescope, although I'm from Norfolk. So for me, that was an Admiral Lord Nelson telescope. Um, and I've had this for so many years. I was given this in 1979. And I should imagine that telescope is older than some of you out there. Um, but the good thing about having a telescope like this is it's ultra portable um, and these are really robust. They have little lenses in the front um, and you can buy refracting. That's what this is called, a refracting telescope. A lot bigger these days, a lot more compact. Um, and the great thing about refracting telescopes is that you don't have to do any adjustments or fiddling with them. You can just get them out and play with them. And all the lenses are usually nice and straight and what you look at is, is wonderful and crisp and clear, you know, subject to a little bit of focusing. So um, the trouble is with refracting telescopes is lenses tend to be quite expensive to make. So refracting telescopes tend to be very expensive for quite a small aperture. Um, about four or five inch apertures tend to be um, as expensive as perhaps this would be. So this is a reflecting telescope. Instead of having four or five inches for my 800 or 1,000 pounds, if that was something I was going to buy, I've got a mirror in the bottom. Can you see the mirror? There's the mirror in the bottom. You might have to, do you know what? I could do something with that. I can go like this. Going to move my camera. Hope nobody gets seasick when I jigger this about. Look at that. That thing in the corner is a tumble dryer. It's not an essential part of astronomy equipment. Don't worry about it. You just happen to be in my, my back room, laundry room. But can you see the mirror in the bottom at the back? Look at that. Um, and it's much easier and cheaper to make massive mirrors than it is to make massive lenses. So if you've got a budget of money and you want to buy a big, big telescope with a really wide aperture, this is 12 inches from there to there, then a reflecting telescope is the way to go, the way to start. So Roy, um, my first one, of the first, one of the Hello. first questions is, what is the best telescope, a refractor or a reflector? Oh, well, that depends on what you want to do with it, um, really. So the best telescopes for an absolute newbies who just want to look at things in the sky, and therefore you want to have a lot of aperture for your money, for your budget, the best telescopes for that are reflecting telescopes like this in this kind of mount. This is called a Dobsonian mount, and that's named after the gentleman called John Dobson who invented it. Um, these break down quite easily. They come apart and this slides down and you can put that in your car and transport that. 
it's not very transportable because it weighs about 30 kilos in, in one piece, but it's good enough to get out in the garden and come back. If you want to do um, astrophotography, take pictures, um, then it's generally accepted that you either want to get a refracting telescope with a smaller aperture, but lots of really high quality lenses in them, especially if you want to take pictures of things like dim and distant galaxies, or you buy a telescope that's, and I always get this wrong, catadioptric, catadioptric. Now that just means it's got a combination of lenses and mirrors in it. Um, and so at the observatory, we've got one catadioptric telescope. It's, it, the type is called a Schmidt Cassegrain or an SCT. Um, and that actually has a, has a virtual focal length twice as big as that. But because of the way all the mirrors and the lenses are, are, are put together, the telescope's actually really quite compact. It's only about a meter long. Um, and they're really good for taking pictures of the moon and planets and things like that. So um, but if you I'm just- gonna, I'm gonna jump in again now, cause that leads on yeah. to the question. Uh, Tracy would like to know, in addition to what type of telescope is good for a, begin for a beginner, whether it's worth getting a computer attachment to follow the stars and how to take photos using the telescope. This is quite a complex question. <laughs> But it's, it is a complex question, but it has a really simple and straightforward answer in a couple of different stages. So the first thing about getting computerized telescopes is generally they require a bit of knowledge about the sky and some time and patience to set them up. Um, but once you've done that, you can basically use a handheld mount and just go through a list of objects and it will automatically point to them. So they are really good. And our main telescope at the observatory is exactly like that. Um, but you, it does require knowing a little bit of knowledge about stars in the sky and how to align your telescope to point to those stars. And for some people, it can take a little bit of a while to set up. Um, some computerized telescopes also require you to take the mount, the thing that the telescope is on, and point that north and then angle a part of the mount and point it at the North Pole star. So it's a bit of time and effort with a computerized telescope to get those set up. And so I don't tend to recommend those for absolute newbies um, unless, unless you do want to maybe do the astrophotography. Um, and that's usually sticking a DSLR camera with an adapter. And I've got an adapter here. So instead of, I've got a Sony camera out the other room. And instead of having the lens on it, you take the lens off, you snap that onto the body of the camera, and then that slots into the eyepiece holder here, so let's just make sure you can see that. So I would take that eyepiece out and I would slot that in there with my camera on. Um, you can also buy, depending on how much money you've got and how rich you are, dedicated astronomy cameras as well. And all of that, all of that requires you to have a motorized tracking mount. That being said, if you've got a cracking massive Dobsonian like this, which is a manually controlled one, I can point that wherever I like, I can hold up um, a mobile phone to the eyepiece and snap pictures. You can also get little adapters that hold your eyepieces on there. And you can take what's called drift type images or videos of the moon and the planets quite easily with a little bit of effort. Um, so you can start off in astrophotography with a manual Dobsonian. But if, if it's your goal or intention to do really hardcore astrophotography, then you want to start off with a computerized mount straight away. Was right. there a second for our, question, for, our complete, for our complete beginners, I've had a few questions as yep. to what different parts of the telescope are called. Because sometimes sure. when you're okay. shopping online, you can buy separate parts, can't you? So you can, and that's that's an interesting thing. So I'm going to take the camera off my tripod here and show you i'm not sure how much wire i've got actually so i don't want to yank this out and suddenly it all goes dark right so um with this telescope here you've got basically the aperture and that's the bit at the boot at the front where the light comes in with a refracting telescope there'd be a lens here with a catadioptric telescope there'd be a lens here as well um, if I go down into the body of the telescope, that's where I've got my main mirror. Now, if this is a reflect a refracting telescope with a lens at the front, that would be our primary lens, our main lens. In a reflecting telescope, the mirrors at the bottom at the back end 
and that's our primary mirror. So this is where all of the light gathering power of our telescope comes from, that primary mirror at the back there. What then happens is that light bounces up onto this mirror here, which is the secondary mirror, and then that bounces up into, I don't know if you can see it there, little hole there, which, so the light hits the primary, hits that secondary mirror, and bounces up through this um, collection of bits and bobs here. And this is the focuser. So this goes up and down. Is that, can you see that going up and down? So that's my focuser. Um, and in here, I've got an eyepiece. Just that out. There we go. And the eyepiece tends to be the bit that that's where you get your magnifying power from. So, and simply put, they all have numbers on them. And that's in technical terms, that's the focal length of the eyepiece. The bigger that number, the more of the sky that you see, but the less zoomed in you are, the less magnification. So this is, if you like, my weakest eyepiece. It's 40 millimeter focal length, but I can see big parts of the sky with this. I can see the moon really clearly, the Andromeda galaxy with that really nicely. But if I want to zoom in on um, maybe the planets, uh, for example, I might get a 20 millimeter or a 10 millimeter focal length eyepiece. As that number goes down, your magnification goes up. Um, and then basically uh, you have the main body of the telescope. That's, I mean, you, we normally just call that the tube or in uh, technical terms, it's known as the OTA. And I'm not quite sure what the O stands for, but I'm pretty sure the T and the A stands for telescope assembly. And then with Dobsonians, the mount is just this kind of, it's almost a bit like a gun turret. If you look, it just swivels around and it goes up and down like that. It's quite, it's quite intuitive to use. With a Dobsonian telescope, the mount and the telescope normally are one. You don't kind of upgrade the telescope, you know, and, and, and leave the mount. You just, with a telescope like this, all you really upgrade is the, the eyepiece. But if you go out and you buy yourself um, maybe a schmidt cassegrain telescope or a refractor, and maybe you've got a really nice tripod that goes with that, you might only, when you come to upgrade, you might only upgrade the telescope. You might keep your tripod and you might upgrade the telescope. Generally speaking, we all keep our eyepieces. When we spend money on nice eyepieces, as astronomers, we all tend to, to, to keep those and just use them in whatever telescopes that we have. Um, I'm just going to put that back in there. Telescopes be, come... Sorry, sorry go on. another question, which is what is the difference between a Dobsonian and a Newtonian? Oh, well, that's good. So it's really just the mount, to be honest. Um, I was just going to quickly say, when you buy your eyepieces, they normally come in two diameter sizes, two inches or one and a quarter inch. And obviously the bigger the eyepieces across there, usually you get just more light come through the eyepiece uh, and you get better kind of field of view. So um, <clears throat> if I can take a few seconds and just have a little drink of water. So um, telescopes like this, refractors. People say that they were invented by Galileo. They weren't actually. Um, telescopes like this were being used uh, by merchants to spot ships coming over the horizon before their competitors so they could get a good price on various you know, goods that were coming in the ships. But it was Galileo who took uh, those telescopes and modified them for, for um, observing in the night sky. So um, telescopes like this are very much uh, thought of as if they having been invented by Galileo. Um, telescopes with a mirror in the bottom, like this one, um, were invented by Sir Isaac Newton. So a telescope with a mirror in the bottom, a primary mirror down there, and a secondary mirror up here is called a Newtonian telescope. This is a Newtonian telescope. However, um, because it's in this kind of mount, we don't say that it's a Newtonian Dobsonian, we just shorten that to Dobsonian. So basically, all Dobsonian telescopes are Newtonian in, in structure, but not all Newtonian telescopes sit on a Dobsonian mount. My first mirrored telescope, my first reflecting telescope, was a small Newtonian, five inches, and it sat on a proper motorized tripod. It wasn't a Dobsonian. Is that clear? Um, we just had another okay? question, which was, yeah, that was good. Thank you. 
Conroy. Um, can you please Good. confirm a reduction in the number on the focusing array slash IPs increases the magnification? And then we got a second question, which is, could you recommend any smartphone cameras that would work with a telescope? Okay, so, um, right. Smartphone cameras these days, any smartphone, you just, just get a smartphone, hold it up to the eyepiece, um, and generally, I, iPhones are quite good at this, um, and Samsungs are quite good. Uh, and the autofocus will normally, especially if you're pointing it at something like the moon, it'll pick it up and you'll be straight off with that, um, taking pictures. Now, what I would say, though, is can you see, like, on the back of this one, it's got four or five different lenses? If you've got a, a mobile phone like that, then what you want to do is when you're in your camera, oh, that's just reflecting. You can't see that, can you? Hold on. Um, what about that? Is that better? There we go. When you're in your camera, along the bottom here, you'll have pro settings. And once you select pro setting, you don't have to worry about these settings, but that selects one of the eyepieces, um, eyepieces, lenses one of the lenses on the back of your camera. Um, if you don't do that, then with the autofocus and zooming in and everything, sometimes you find that the lenses flip flop, it'll choose the long range lens and it'll try and use the short range lens and so on. Um, but just give it a go. Um, the second thing in terms of confirming the way that the magnification works, there's a simple calculation that you can do you might not be able to see it, but on there it says that the focal length of this telescope is 1,500 millimetres. To work out how much your telescope will magnify something, you take the focal length of the telescope, so that's 1,500, and you divide it by the focal length of your eyepiece. And that tells you what your magnification is. So, for example, if I had a 1,000, I'm going to just choose some random numbers here to make the maths easy. If I had a 1000 millimeter focal length telescope and a 100 millimeter eyepiece, then I would take the big number divided by the small number, a thousand divided by a hundred, and the magnification that that combination of telescope and lenses would be 10,000 divided by a hundred. I mean, I don't know why you do that. That would be pointless. But if you then got a 10 millimeter eyepiece and you kept your 1000 millimeter telescope, the sum is now for magnification, 1000 millimeters, which is again, the focal length of that, divided by your new eyepiece, your 10 millimeter eyepiece, that's 10 millimeters, 1000 divided by 10 is 100. So now just by changing the eyepiece from a 100 to a 10 millimeter, you've got 100 times magnification. Okay. Any more questions, Danny? That helps me with the microscope lens I've got. Didn't think it would work with my phone. Cheers. So you had a had a thank you, <laughs> but no more questions, I don't think. Unless anyone okay. anyone wants to ask any quickly now. Oh, sorry, I've just turned the chat off. There we go. No questions means you're explaining it well. So Yeah, it must be. Either that <laughs> or um just talking load of rubbish because like, it's been a long time with us being closed at the observatory it's been a long time since i've talked to anybody about this i, th I think i'm getting it right so if you're all happy with that um, um i just want to finish off a couple of things on my presentation on my slide what i'd like to do is again show you that link where you can download this stargazing guide um and then i'm going to show you basically how to use it and obviously danny this is being recorded isn't it so I'm assuming this is going to go on YouTube or something and people can come back to this video and use yeah, the it guide. Will hopefully be on YouTube. So if you follow Project North, yeah. which most of you are, um, it'll be on the on our Facebook or it'll be on the National Parks YouTube. We have had one more question. Oh, we've had a couple more questions actually, oh. right, sorry. Uh, That's oh, fine. No. Go on. Some thank yous. And as an absolute beginner, what would you recommend buying? Right, honestly, truthfully, if you're kind of thinking that getting a go-to telescope is going to make it easy for you, the problem with that is you're going to have to set it up and that's tricky. And in order to set it up, you're going to have to know a little bit about telescopes and the sky and you're going to have to learn that. Um, so a really good way to learn is just go for a manual telescope. And honestly, I would buy the biggest manual Dobsonian you can afford. Um, you can buy tabletop 
five, four and five inch Dobsonians for about 100, 150 pounds. You can buy them on tripods um, for a, a bit more than that. You can buy five inch Newtonians on go to mounts for about 300 quid. So that's pretty good as well. But for 300 quid, you could get an eight or nine inch Dobsonian. Um, and the thing about the Dobsonian is it's just so easy to throw around the sky and point at things. Uh, in addition to being able to just manually track things as they move, as the sky moves. Um, so yeah, that would be it. Unless you're going to do astrophotography, in which case it's a much more complicated answer. The yeah. simple answer is buy the biggest Dobsonian you can afford. The next question is uh, about the weather and how the weather affects the instruments. So I guess you know, if it's cold like it is now and you want to go stargazing, how do you prepare your telescope to take it outside? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things that are going to happen there. And one of those things is that the, for a Dobsonian like this, the secondary mirror here is going to freeze up uh, once it's been out for an hour or two. Um, and you can combat that by um, putting shrouds and things on. I've got a little shroud that goes around here. Um, when I'm you know, in between, when I'm moving it around the sky in between it, I, I'll give it the, the, the mirror and there's going to be some people that hate me for saying this. I'll give it a little wipe with the tissue. Um, you know, the little um, pocket tissues that you can get in the little if you like handy pocket things. Pull one of those out. If you get a bit of ice or do you want it, give it a really gentle wipe. And then that tissue goes in the recycling. Don't use it again. Um, so that, that's one thing you've got to look out for. And um, with, with refractors and schmidt cassegrain telescopes, the lens on the front gets really misty really quickly. And you can get what's called a dew heater for those, a little kind of band, an electrified band. Uh, you can get them for cameras as well. And you plug them into a, um, a little power bank and they kind of warm it up. And it's a bit like, you know, when you're in the car and the back window of your car steams up and those little wires through the through the window kind of warm up the glass a little bit. It's kind of like that. Um, you can actually buy them for these as well. I've, I mean, I've looked into it. You can buy them and have them mounted on these mirrors, but it just seems like too much of a, of a hassle, really. Now, there is a thing whereby um, you may or may not know that as things heat up or cool down, they expand and contract. Um, and particularly with reflecting telescopes that have lenses and then air or nitrogens trapped inside them. Um, if you want to do some really high quality observing or some imaging, when you take your telescope outside into the cold, you know, it's what I mean, it's minus five out there right now and it's 20 degrees in here. You need to let it cool down. You need to let the telescope kind of cool down to the ambient temperature of the outside um, before you use it. Uh, I, strictly speaking, don't always do that. I'll be honest with you. If I want to do some observing, I'll just get the telescope out and I'll, and I'll start looking at things. I've never noticed that much of a big difference between a slightly warm telescope in the outside, you know, in the cold. Um, but some people do. But you, you definitely need to do that if, you, if you're imaging. You need to take your telescope outside and leave it outside in the cold, maybe with a, a, a little blanket or something over it so it doesn't frost up. Um, Right, we've got some more questions yeah, now. That's it. So, um, Go on. what brand binoculars do you recommend for a beginner? Um, so, I would say uh, whatever you can afford, okay? Um, however, for really good quality and robustness, Helios are a good make, H-E-L-I-O-S, Helios. Um, and they have a brand of binocular called the Field Master, and they're really good. You can get 10 or 12 times magnification, 50 millimeter Helios Field Masters for about 50 or 60 quid on, on Amazon or your, um, your chosen purveyor of uh, optical equipment. This is a brand that's quite new. Well, it's not really that new. The last couple of years, Opticron has come into the market. I've seen a lot of these around. I've got a few pairs of these Opticrons. Um, and in fact, the binoculars that I own for my own personal use, these ones here, these are nitrogen filled uh, long eye relief Opticron image TGAWPs. And they're really, really good. 
Um, I'm not a big fan of the really cheap optochroms, I must say. So if you're going to think about spending maybe 100, 200 quid on binoculars, then optochron are great. If you're only going to spend, think about spending 30, 40 or 50 quid, then you want to go for something like Helios. Thank um, you, Roy. But ultimately, buy what you can afford. The next question is, I understand a new telescope may need collimating, which is a word that I come across all the time yes. and it terrifies me. <laughs> is that yes. easy to do? No, <laughs> it's really <laughs> tricky. Um, so I did, when I was talking about the refracting telescope, I was talking about how one of the benefits of them is that the lenses are fixed in the tube and they're perfectly aligned. One of the problems with um, the mirrored telescopes is that due to various things like moving them around, um, but also due to changes in temperature and you know so on, um, the mirror in the bottom can become slightly out of place. So there's it's got loads of screws in the bottom. I'll see if I can show you actually. And what you have to do is right, uh, basically adjust those screws in the bottom of the main mirror and in the top of the primary mirror. So let me just see, there we go. So that's the bottom of my telescope. Um, and you can see there's these little screws here. So that, that smaller one's a locking screw that's holding the mirror in place from when I last collimated it. Um, and this is the screw. If I, if I twist that one way or the other way, that part of the mirror is gonna move up or down slightly. Um, and then in the top part of the mirror, let's see if I can turn this around without destroying anything or knocking anything over. In the top part of the mirror, you've got these screws. Can you just see there's three little screws in there and a screw in the middle? And they adjust the position of that mirror. I would say, though, that every time I've bought a brand new Newtonian or Dobsonian telescope, it's worked really well out of the box. And it might have needed a little bit of minor collimation, um, but honestly, by and large, it's not something to be that that stressed about or worried about. Again, unless you want to take pictures. Um, with use, though, these telescopes do get knocked about, and then the mirrors do um, <clears throat> end up moving. And there's two ways you can collimate them. And I've got a box of tricks somewhere. Go. You can either stick a laser in. I hope the batteries are still working on this. Maybe they're not. Don't look into it, Roy. That's not me. There we go. So there's a laser collimator. So that fires, you put that in there and it fires a laser beam on the secondary down to the primary back up and back again. And it's got a little grid, a uh, little grid in there. So when you put it in, your little dot moves around. And as you move those mirrors, that dot moves around. With a telescope this big, it's a two-person job. Um, it's not that difficult, to be honest. It's just a pain in the bum. Uh, and the, or you can use this. This is called a Cheshire. So the laser collimators cost many tens of pounds. You can buy a Cheshire from uh, China for about 15, 12, 15 pounds. Um, and similarly, you put that in the eyepiece and it's got these little wire veins in and um, a little 45 degree angle mirror in there. And you're basically looking through that little pinhole in the top. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. And again, you're just using the optics of that to align with your mirrors as well. Um, I don't collimate my telescopes as much as I probably should, Danny, to be honest. The admission of guilt there. But then I'm not that fast. I generally, I love the moon, you see. I, the moon is my favourite object. And you don't really need to worry about collimation if you're looking at the moon. It's only when you're looking at, you know, really faint, detailed stuff like the stars and things. We've got um, one more question, which is with manual scope. I was just going to say, sorry, just there oh, are sorry. loads of videos on YouTube about how to collimate, by the way. So just get on YouTube and have a look. Um, yes, yeah, so the last question is with manual scopes, is it beneficial to have a finder scope with magnification or an unmagnified one or one of each? <laughs> Okay, so this is personal preference. Um, on mine here, can you see my finder scope there? Is that in? Yeah, good. So um, I much prefer finder scopes. You can also have these things called uh, um, 
I'd maybe uh, just, right. just a few words as well, Roy, for total beginners. What is, what is a finder scope used for? Yeah, I'm gonna I, I will get to that. <laughs> I'm gonna mention I'm gonna mention the alternatives first that I hate and don't recommend, and then talk lavishly and complimentarily about my wonderful finder scope with no bias at all in any way, shape, or form. Um, so you can get like red dot red dot finders that sit in in this little mount here. You can get these things called tell rads that are pretty cool actually if they're set up properly. But they're, but they're both of those things are battery powered, and if the batteries go, or if it gets too cold and the batteries give up, then you can't find you can't it won't work. These things have little red dot lasery things, and if the batteries run out, you know, then you you, you to use a technical term, you're knackered. Um, whereas this is just a little telescope, and in fact, look at that, it's a refracting telescope with a lens at the front, little lens at the back. And this one is 50 millimeters, so it's the same aperture as my binoculars, I think, he says. Let's just check. Uh, not far off. And I think this is 10 times. So this is, broadly speaking, the same magnification as um, the binoculars. And what they've got in them, I don't know if this is going to work, actually. Oh, yeah, look at that. You can see it. It's got this. Can you see the crosshairs? Now, if you play Call of Duty, boom, headshot, you know, it's like a little sniper thing there. But basically, um, these are not battery powered. They'll never run out of energy. They'll never get too cold and stop working. And actually looking at something through the finder scope uh, with that little bit of magnification in and of itself can be quite a pleasant thing, um, especially if you've pointed the telescope at roughly the part of the sky um, that you expect your object to be. You can't quite see it through the eyepiece. You know, you look through your finder scope and you see a few stars and actually there's the object there. And you can move your, uh, your main scope and bring it all back, bring it all into view. Um, I am yet to be converted about the benefits of red dot finders, laser finders or towel rads. Any other questions? Quite a lot of chat there. Um, are today's smartphones such as Samsung S21 Ultra not good for astrophotography without a telescope? That's a good question. So um, I've got that. This is no, in fact, this is the S20 Ultra, uh, but I've also I've still I've kept my Huawei P30 Pro, and I would have upgraded to a P40 Pro had um, we'd not had all this nonsense about you know chinese phones and spying and google and all of that i'd have gone straight for a huawei p40 pro actually because the zoom on the huawei p on the huawei p30 and also all the inbuilt things like it's got an inbuilt star trailing thing and the um the, the sensitivity of the chip and everything seems to be really good i've taken some awesome astro photos with my huawei um just in just itself sitting on a, on a on a on a tripod but i must say the zoom capabilities of this is really good as well um the huawei seems to have a lot, a lot better kind of ai and kind of stitches the image together a little bit better um the pixel 4 has got a dedicated astrophotography um option to it and i was actually last month i was having a twitter conversation with the author neil gaiman uh, because he was taking pictures of things with his Pixel 4, and that was really good, actually, um, really good quality. So pretty much any decent uh, modern, and by modern, I mean in the last couple of years, mobile phone, you can either stick it on a tripod in itself and take some pictures of the night sky or put it up to the eyepiece of a telescope and take pictures through the telescope. They're all pretty good with or without a telescope. Well, thanks, Roy. I think that's all the questions for the moment. So if you can move on to your next bit now, I think. And then yeah. if anyone's got any more questions, um, as you think of them, put them in the chat, because I think we're doing OK in uh, throwing them out at Roy. Hi, and I think I hopefully I'm doing OK in answering them. Um, if I don't know the answer to something, I'll definitely say I don't know, and then we'll head off to Google and find out. Um, right, so what I'm going to do here, just to finish off, is show you my four favourite objects for newbie stargazers, beginner stargazers to look at in the night sky, either with your naked eye, with binoculars, 
or with a telescope or all of those things. Every single one of these four things, we see four things you can see with or without equipment. The darker your skies, the better. But I live in central Gateshead and I can see on a good clear night, I can see three of these objects, naked eye. Um, I can see three of them, maybe, maybe the fourth one with binoculars. Um, and I can definitely see them all with a telescope. So um, you can download the stargazing guide by going to our website there. Um, and what it'll look like is this. There are lots and lots of panels on the stargazing guide and it's double sided. But all I'm going to do is focus on one of them. Um, and what you'll see when you download it is that that panel has red circles on it. And those red circles correspond to the four things I'm going to show you now. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just have a little drink. So what I'm hoping with this stargazing guide is it will help you to, first of all, see uh, and and recognize and navigate to the two main constellations that we would look at looking north that's what the n is in the corner there looking north um where we start stargazing most people will either recognize or have been shown or quite easily be able to find the plow or the big dipper i grew up calling it the big dipper um and most people know that two of the stars there if you look at those two stars uh, they, they line up and point to Polaris, the North Pole star. Um, if you carry on going, you end up on the tail star of Cassiopeia. And if you just tilt your head there, for me, I have to tilt my head that way. Cassiopeia looks like a W, like a letter W in the sky. So she sits in the sky like that. And she was the queen of Ethiopia, apparently. So it is OK to call her a she. Um, and she sits right slap bang in the Milky Way. So if you can find the plough, go across to the North Pole Star and Cassiopeia, then you are looking at the Milky Way. Now, if you like, if if you live somewhere like I do, you've got a little bit of light pollution, it's difficult to see naked eye. But honestly, grab a pair of binoculars, even toy binoculars, actually, and point it at that part of the sky. Hundreds of stars is great. OK. Now, whether you've looked at the plough before or not, and it is a very common um, Thing for people to start when they are beginning stargazing. What I want you to do is the next time you look at it, look at the second star in the handle of the plow, because it's actually two stars. It's a double star. And it's not a binary. Binary stars orbit around each other like this, whereas double stars are stars that are actually really far away. Get my hands in the right place like that. But we're lined up in such a way that when you look at them, although one's really far away and one's closest to us, they look like that. They look like they're next to each other. Um, so this is a double star, and it's one you can see with the naked eye pretty much from anywhere. Um, so I really want you to have a look for that if you can. Get your binoculars on it, you'll easily see it's two stars. And if you get your telescope on it, you might see that the big bright star is actually two stars. I was going to say three. It, if you've got something as big as the Hubble, there's about six stars there in total. But with a, with a big enough telescope, you'll see three stars. Um, but it's a visual naked eye double star. Second star in the handle, OK? If you manage to find your way from those two double stars there to the North Pole star, um, so follow the uh, two stars in the, in the, at the end of the plough, if you like, in a straight line, um, to see this naked eye, you do need dark skies, actually. So if you've got them, grab a pair of binoculars and look just a little bit further, just a little bit further than um, the pole star. And what you'll see is a little very well spread out cluster of stars. Um, and some of you may have heard of a gentleman who um, died in 2014, who was pretty good at astronomy called Sir Patrick Moore. Um, and he came up with this catalogue of objects that everybody should try and see. Uh, in their lives called the Coldwell catalogue, Coldwell, because that was his middle name. Um, and this object, this cluster, is the first object in that list, in that catalogue, is C1. Um, and as you can see, there's stars that have different colours in it, uh, which normally you can see different colours with binoculars. And sometimes you can see different coloured stars with the naked eye, for example, if you look at Betelgeuse. Are we doing the CPRE star count, Danny? Are we promoting that? Because that's happening at the minute, isn't it? And, 
looking at the stars in Orion, you can see the red star Betelgeuse and the blue star Rigel. If you look at clusters, you could often see different colour stars too. It's really spread out. So when you do look at it, if you've got binoculars, then just have a little look um, by wiggling around your, uh, your binoculars really gently and carefully to kind of explore the sky. The second to last object, the third object. Um, now, for me, my panel of all of you wonderful people is over half of my half of this picture. So I can only see one cluster of stars here. Can I move it? Oh, I can move my panel. There you go. So I've just moved you all across to the left, clicked on the bar at the top. And now I can see this picture in all its glory. This is the double cluster. All these images, by the way, are taken with fairly kind of low powered telescopes. So the, this is what you'd expect to see through a telescope. Not a great deal of color um, and a little bit of detail. Um, and to find this, the double cluster, which has about 7,000 stars in it, give or take, find Cassiopeia, that W shape, um, and don't look at it as it's an E or a three or an M, orient yourself so that it's a W, and then follow the two stars there for that part of the W just to the left. And if you're somewhere really dark, you'll see a fuzzy dumbbell shape. And this is where your averted viewing. Remember, we talked about averted viewing about half an hour ago. As you're looking up, you'll kind of see it out the corner of your eye if you're somewhere dark. Um, but as you look right at it, it'll kind of vanish. It's a really strange phenomenon. So look around it or slightly away from it and you'll see it. Easy to find in binoculars uh, if you follow that line. But you know what? If you get lost, if you're out there stargazing, naked eye or, or with binoculars, and you get lost in this part of the sky, just kind of relax into it because there is so much in this part of the sky, so many um, different colored stars, so many constellations, there's variable stars. If you've got a decent pair of binoculars or a small telescope, there's lots of little galaxies and nebulae. This is a great part of the sky just to lose yourself in. Okay. The final object I'm going to show you is another galaxy. Now, up until now, everything that you'll see in the sky, everything that we've talked about is within the Milky Way, when that's the name of our galaxy. Um, and galaxies are huge. You know, clusters are massive. I mean, that cluster there has got seven odd thousand stars in it. That's a lot of stars, but that cluster is inside our Milky Way. And there are some clusters that have hundreds of thousands of stars, but it's still part of the Milky Way. Galaxies have hundreds of billions of stars and they're separated by vast distances. So if you were to jump in the Millennium Falcon, say for example, and travel at light speed from where we are now to the edge of our galaxy, it might take you a few tens of thousands of years to do it. But then once you kind of get to the outer edges of our galaxy and start flying out into empty space and you leave our Milky Way behind you, where are you going? You know, because it's empty, there's nothing really there. But yeah, off in the distance, you see another galaxy. And this galaxy is two and a half million light years away. So traveling at light speed, it's gonna take you two and a half million years to get there. And then when you get there, billions and billions of stars again. Um, and that's what galaxies are. They're basically islands of stars in the black empty ocean of space. And you can see one from your back garden called the Andromeda galaxy. And this is our next door neighbor. Um, there's been lots of discussion over the last year or so about actually how big this is and how many stars there are, ranging between a few billion to a, a few trillion. But it's a lot. Let's all agree it's a lot of stars. And to find this, what you want to do is I'm going to have to move my screen of you lot all over again to the other side um, to just expose that little red circle there. But the best way to find this is to, again, come to Cassiopeia. Instead of going left, we're going to go right, but we're going to use the right hand part of Cassiopeia as an arrow and it's going to point straight down towards through the Milky Way and towards three or four little stars in a row. And the dimmest star is right next to this galaxy. And it's a beautiful thing to find. This is quite big, actually. Um, I have seen it once naked eye from my back garden here in Gateshead and I've lived here now for six months. So that was it was really good conditions to find that. But it's easy peasy with binoculars. Difficult if the moon's out because the moon is natural light pollution. 
But if, like tonight, it's a completely moonless night, if I went out with my binoculars, I'd easily find it. And so will you with a bit of practice. And you've got to trust me on that because it's so big and it's so bright that as you get near it with the binoculars, you see this beautiful glow, okay? Um, and the, the darker your skies are, the brighter and the wider that glow is and the easier it is to find. So there's your four things to look for. Um, binoculars are ideal for all of these objects. Telescope, if you've got it, is great. If you want to try and see them all naked eye, you've got to go somewhere dark, um, which is a bit tricky at the minute under lockdown, isn't it? I think. So there we go. Um, uh, in terms of what you should expect to see, by the way, when you look at things through telescopes and binoculars, the pictures I've just shown you are how they would look in a great big telescope like this. So not a lot of colour, not a lot of detail in the galaxies, um, but it's still impressive and it's still pretty cool. Just don't think that you're going to see, you know, when you when you see on the news, or actually sometimes you buy telescopes and they've got pictures on the box that have been taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. You're not going to see that. Um, and if you turn your telescope onto the planets, um, depending on your magnification levels, that's what you're going to see in the middle there. That's the middle one there. That's actually a picture taken by with a mobile phone of Jupiter and its four moons through a small to medium sized telescope. And with a telescope like that, it's very difficult to see detail on Jupiter, but sometimes you can see one or two stripes. With a bigger telescope like this, on a really good clear night, what you'll see is what's in the bottom picture. You'll just about make out the great red spot. You'll see more than a couple of stripes of clouds and you'll see a bit more of the moons in a bit more detail as well. Um, so there you go. Ask me anything, get out there and try it. That's the, that's the key, isn't it? I think that's me, Danny. I think that's the end of it. Yep, yeah, that's it. That's that presentation. No, well, thanks very much, Roy. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. Anything? I've got plenty of time. <laughs> Don't tell them that, Roy. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks very much. I found that really interesting. It's answered some of my questions as well. Um, for you all to know, <clears throat> when times are back to normal, uh, we are actually developing a mobile observatory ourselves at the moment. So sadly, just before COVID, um, we got a grant where we could buy a, a vehicle and we kitted it out with some basic telescopes so we could bring them around to people and then COVID happened, but they're still there. And when we're allowed to go out and play, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be coming around um, with our telescopes and binoculars and showing people how to use them. Um, there was one question that's just come in, Roy, which is, what is the specification of your Dobsonian behind you? <clears throat> okay, this is a Skywatcher flex tube. That's what this is. So normally with the Dobsonian, that comes as a solid tube. Um, but I take this out to various places with me and to get it in the car, you unscrew some of these things down here and all of that slides down, it becomes much more compact. So it's a, it's a Skywatcher flex tube Dobsonian and it has a focal length of 1500 millimeters and a diameter of 12 inches. Don't ask me why one of those is in metric and the other is imperial, I don't know. Um, if you want the diameter in uh, metric it's 305 millimeters but generally in the astronomy community we talk about apertures in inches and focal lengths in uh, millimeters. But that's it. That's all it is. Um, one more question. So <coughs> I bought a Celestron 102 SLT next star. So that's a specific model. So I don't know if you know that model. Yeah. That's a good start. I know the next star. Yeah. I missed the back end of that question because I spoke over you rather rudely, Danny. Sorry. Say that again. Sorry. I didn't hear the. All I heard was um, that the person bought a Celestron next star. Is that, is that a good start? Is that a good starting telescope? I'm going to say if it's a telescope you've bought and you're going to use it, then it's a good telescope. Any <laughs> telescope you buy that you use is going to be a good telescope. Um, what is it? A Celestron what next star? Celestron 102 SLT next star. We've got the next star 8SE, which I really like. I think yeah, I, I like the next stars. Yeah, they are good. Um, Let me have a look. And that looks like a. Another question. That's a refractor. 
Oh, hold on. Stop a second. That mount, um, that was the mount that I had for my first ever um, telescope. So that's a nice little mount. Um, and I do like the Celestron handset. It's quite a small actual telescope, though. So um, I would, the next thing I would do if, if you wanted to spend a bit of money, I'd upgrade that to a Newtonian, a five inch or a six inch Newtonian, but keep the mount. And then there was a question. Somebody would like to book you for their STEM club or a school, I think I read. So how do they okay. get in touch with you, Roy? <clears throat> um, I am more than happy for you to share my email address with people, Danny. That's absolutely fine. Great, okay. And I guess, what's your company called? Virtual Astro? No, nope, it's not called that, is it at all? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's Virtual Astro. Astro is the guy on Twitter with like a million um, followers. Yes, I wish I had that. Uh, we are Astro Ventures, Astro yeah. Ventures, um, and we are a social enterprise. So, um, yeah, when before all the COVID stuff hit, we were doing STEM stuff in schools. Sometimes being, you know, paying for it, sometimes for free, uh, depending on the school and the environment. Um, so it'd be nice to get back to doing that again. Okay, so I think that's everything so thank you everyone for listening to your and um yes my mobile observatory will be coming all over north wales to anglesey just a reminder as well that if you are have got clear skies you can see orion outside tonight go and do your star count for the campaign for mm -hmm. the protection of rural england the cpre even though they are an english charity it is a nationwide star count and they're looking at how many stars you can see in the night sky to see how light polluted the skies are across the UK. Um, but thanks very much. I hope you all have a lovely time stargazing. Don't get frostbite out there. It is Baltic. And I hope to see you all it soon is another cold. event. And thank you very much, Roy. Yeah, thank you for all your wonderful questions and thank you for having me, Danny. <laughs>